Hi, Pro-Life Jen. It's Kristen Hawkins, and welcome to this new episode of the Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. As you know, we are in the abortion uh, crimes series. I'm so excited to be bringing these very special shows to you. Today, I have a very special guest, a good friend who I've known for a number of years in the pro-life movement, Mark Crutcher, the founder and president of Life Dynamics Incorporated down in Denton, Texas. Uh, Mark uh, has done a number of investigations over the years, and I think you could probably classify him as the original undercover investigator of the pro-life movement, undercover, you know, going undercover, showing how the abortion industry was selling the parts of children they abort, how they were um, allowing sexual predators uh, to get away with their crimes and shepherding young women into an abortion facilities, Planned Parenthoods and other abortion facilities without those uh, sexual crimes, uh, statutory rapes, sexual assaults ever being reported. A lot of folks within the pro-life movement have learned a lot from Mark over the years. I think uh, one of the things he's most proud about is uh, he, he and his team being labeled as the CIA of the pro-life movement by a New York uh, newspaper not long ago. Um, you probably have seen his work around um, one of my first books I remember reading in a pregnancy center when I was 15 was called Line 5, written by Mark and his team. Under, you know, we went undercover into the abortion industry, showing the misdeeds of the abortion agents. Uh, you know, it's Father Frank Pavone's very famous line of you can't practice vice virtuously. And that's exactly what Mark and his team showed in line five. These abortionists, not, you know, they're killing children every day, but they're also harming women. Um, they're, you know, not paying their taxes. It should, really shouldn't be surprising to us. His most recent investigation that you all have probably heard about is Maafa 21, M-A-A-F-A 21, where he un undercovered the really eugenic roots, the racist roots of the abortion industry. So we have a lot to talk about today, as you can see. I'm a big fan of Mark and his work. Thanks for joining me today. Um, what's going on at Life Dynamics right now? Well, first off, it's nice to hear from you again. We haven't talked in quite a while. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of things going on at Life Dynamics. We are in the process of moving and we'll be making some, once this move is over, if I live through it. Um, and, you know, there's nothing in the world more miserable than moving. That's but, true. Uh, you know, I told Tulane last time we, we built a house in 2000. And when we moved into that house, I said, this is it. The next move you make will be with your next husband because we're not doing it. But anyway, she hadn't dropped me yet. We just had our 50th wedding anniversary. So that's a big thing that's, that's happening at Life Dynamics. But um, we've got some new things. I don't want to really want to talk about them before we, we um, launch them. Um, but holding true to your CIA of the pro-life movement mantra. You don't want to talk about it until you launch them. So you can't even give us the goods. No, but we've got some things planned I think are going to be pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things we need to do, Kristen, is um, we need to, re first off, we need to return to our roots in the pro-life movement. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is, um, in a lot of ways, and, and we I'm not pointing fingers at anybody else. We've been as guilty of this as anybody. Um, the movement's gotten too corporate, and it never was mm -hmm. intended to be that. It was always a grassroots movement. Um, of people that um, just ordinary people that were fighting abortion. They didn't need a, a giant mailing list and they didn't need uh, TV shows and podcasts and all this stuff. And those things are all good communication uh, tools to use, but they can't become the central theme of the pro-life movement. Um, right. We also need, and I know that you've, that you agree with me on this, um, we need to return to our roots in the sense that we oppose abortion, period, across the table. No compromise, no exceptions, no apologies. That's always been our motto here at Life Dynamics, as you know. Um, and we have, uh, and a lot of times you can look around other pro-life groups and see that they've kind of drifted away from that. And mm -hmm. it's not that they're bad people. It's just that they think that compromise is the way to win more people into the movement. And that's totally untrue. When people 
hear you say that the unborn child is a living human being, but then they see you willing to compromise, they don't have credit. You don't have credibility with them. You lose credibility mm -hmm. with those people. Um, and you know, as long as you stick to the pure 100% pro-life position, you never have to apologize for anything. You never have to explain your position. It's crystal clear. And the crystal clear position is that an unborn child at any stage of, of its existence from the moment of fertilization onward um, mm -hmm. is a living human being. It's no different than a three-year-old or a five-year-old or a 50-year-old or a 70-year-old. And we've got to get back to pushing that um, message and doing it more aggressively. Um, but we also have to um, craft our approach to the modern uh, world. Um, mm -hmm. And as you know, we produced a television show and you were a co-host on it for, for some time uh, called Life Talk. We started that in the early 90s. And for 20 years, it was basically the way the pro-life movement communicated. We had uh, every pro-life organization represented uh, in the country. We had all the leaders of the pro-life movement uh, were on Life Talk at one time or another. And uh, we dealt with every kind of subject that you can imagine. Um, you mentioned earlier that we were the group that came up with the, that uh, exposed the trafficking in baby, baby body parts. We actually revealed that on a Life Talk uh, edition. So, but, but time came and it was really hard for me to accept that the era of Life Talk had passed. People weren't watching DVDs anymore. Um, if you couldn't get I your- don't even have a I'm sorry? <laughs> I don't even think I have a DVD player, Mark. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's so weird the way technology changes nowadays, uh, Kristen. Something new comes out and it's the Super Godzilla Belch Fire 5000 latest thing. And six months later, you're throwing it away because it's it's been superseded. Yeah, I think that's uh, what your point is well taken about getting back to our roots in the pro-life movement too, because you have to realize these tools that we have, podcasts and social media, they are simply tools um, that we use to communicate, but they are not our strategies <laughs> in which we seek right. to accomplish our goals. Um, and if we use those tools to, 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 to broadcast a compromised message, we went backwards, mm -hmm. not forwards. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very, it's very important that we, that we are constantly watching out to make sure we're not slipping backwards. Cause I've seen that happen a lot of times. Yeah. And that's, I think I actually did a podcast not long ago about this, and especially now we're looking at a post Dobbs uh, America where, you know, abortion is going to, you know, depending on what the Supreme Court, and we never know how the Supreme Court's going to rule, um, it, you know, if they uphold the Mississippi ab abortion law that bans abortion at 15 weeks, the conversation will be on first trimester abortions. And we have to be very careful because so many in the movement have focused on these late trimester abortions. Uh, and we haven't, I don't think, given equal time to the embryo, the zygote, the, the fetus, whatever you want to call the child in the womb in the first trimester and make that case to the American public as to why that child in the first few weeks of life is just as equally valuable and why an abortion on that child at five weeks is just as equally horrible as a child at 30 weeks. And because we're, we're looking at an era where second and third trimester abortions very soon can be made illegal. And, you know, with the abortion industry, and you know, Mark, what they're coming up with everything they're doing a chemical abortion, their goal is to get the abortions all in the first trimester and at home so that they don't have to convince an abortionist to do them. But I think it's important and why I really wanted to have you kind of come on and, and kind of educate people about what, what you're doing in life dynamics. But I, I just remember when I was working at the pregnancy center when I was 15, one of the first books I picked up was Line 5. I like the color. You're a great marketer. It was green and black and green. It looked scary. And I was like, what is this? It looked, you know, out of place at a pregnancy center where everything was like pink and hearts and purple roses and flowers. Um, but can you tell viewers why you wrote Lime 5 and what you uncovered? Because I think it's a book that, you know, everyone in the pro-life movement, every activist starting out really needs to, to, to read. Well, I was discouraged by hearing a lot of people in the pro-life movements making statements or taking positions that made it appear that 
the provision of abortion is like the provision of any other health care uh, activity. Mm -hmm. First off, abortion is not health care. For abortion to be health care, a woman ha would have to be healthier after an abortion than she was before. And that's yeah. not physically not true. That's scientifically untrue. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, there was a lot of people before I wrote line five who perceived that a woman going into an abortion, uh, abortion mill, was entering the same kind of type of facility that they entered when they went to the to their OBGYN or to their GP or whatever. They had the flu or they took their kid in for a checkup. And their perception was that the abortion industry was just that. They happened to be doing a bad procedure, but that's the way the abortion industry operated. It was a the, the abortion industry just wants you to believe that it's just another medical environment. Um, nothing could be further from the truth than that. And I wrote, I released Lime 5 in 1996, and I've had a lot of people say to me, we've sold over 108,000 copies of it, and my understanding is it's the number one selling book in the history of the pro-life movement. Uh, Dr. Wilkie, who I think most people thought his book was, he told me that we had sold more Lime Fives than he had sold of his books, but that's beside the point. The point is that we've educated a lot of people about the fact that this environment is not like any other medical environment. And kind of like what Dr. I mean, like what Father Frank always says you, um, about the doing a non-virtuous thing virtuously. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought my my take on that was you can't do a, a wrong thing the right way, and that's the exist that's the situation with abortion. And um, so it's very important that we all the new people that come into the movement um, realize this because they come in listening to the to the pro aborts tell them that this is just a standard medical environment where pregnancy terminations are performed. Um, and the point I want to make to people is I've had people say, well, you wrote that book in 1996 or you released it in 96. Surely things have gotten better. No, things have gotten worse. Everything that we talked about in line five, everything um, is worse today than it was uh, in 96 when we released the book. Every single thing we look at is worse. So don't think that these people have cleaned up their act. And I even had people in the pro-life movement criticize me at the time that I released Lime 5 and saying, look, what you're causing to happen here is the abortion industry to clean up their act, and that'll make them harder to deal with. And I always tell them, don't worry about it. They cannot clean up their act. There's no right way to do a wrong thing. They can't clean up their act uh, for a variety of reasons. But uh, – Everything that's happening that's hap that we talked about in, in line five is worse today than it was then. What were some of, I mean, I just remember when I was reading line five, you had chapters of, you know, just, you know, medical issues that women, you know, near death uh, experiences women had. I think there was a chapter on um, like the finances of some of these abortionists and how they, you know, they don't, you know, surprise, surprise, someone who kills babies doesn't pay their taxes. Um, right. What were some of the most surprising things that you found when you when you were doing the research? And by the way, how did you find out all this stuff that the abortion industry was doing? At the time, um, I had five people on staff doing nothing but research for that book. And um, so we were delving into places that most pro-life groups never went into. Um, but as far as the thing that surprised us, the, the medical things, the extreme injuries, the, the strange injuries that you'd have in, in the abortion industry, that didn't surprise us so much because we had already been in, been seeing that stuff in, in the work, the kind of work that we do. Mal, we were bringing a lot of malpractice cases against the abortion industry. And so we would see these things, mm -hmm. but there's one chapter in Lyme five that, when we when I laid out the original outline for the book, this chapter wasn't even in there. We didn't know it existed, um, that this problem existed. And but as we researched this, we found this was more and more common. And so finally, we put a chapter in there, and uh, the chapter is called "The Canned Hunt." And what this is about is the number of women that get raped and sexually assaulted in abortion clinics. And when you tell people that, they say, "No, you know, it's like any other medical environment, you know." A doctor wouldn't do that, and if he did, he'd wind up in prison within hours. Um, that's not the way the abortion industry works, and it is very common for women to be raped and sexually assaulted in abortion clinics, and we have since 
I wrote line five, we have done follow-up investigations on that. And that's a problem that's still going on today. You've got practicing abortion abortionists in this country right now who are in business right now who have been um, accused and in some cases convicted of sexually assaulting patients. And we have on our website um, the results of a, of a later study that we did on that subject. And we name names and we tell you where we got the information, what police records, what autopsy records, whatever, where we got the information from. Um, but that's something that most people don't think about. Mm -hmm. And I've had people say, well, why would a woman get raped in an abortion clinic? And the answer to that is very simple. First off, I think we would both agree that you have men with very sketchy morals uh, doing working in these places. They also are dealing with patients, the vast majority of whom can't tell anybody where they are. The vast majority of women having abortions are one of the motivations for it is to hide either the pregnancy or their sexual activity or their pregnancy or their uh, whatever that they're trying to hide from somebody else. Sometimes it's a it's a mother or, or a father or uh, a husband or whoever it might be. If an abortionist finds out he's talking to a 15 year old girl and they ask in the um, question and answer session up front, the so-called counseling that they give, if they ask her if she's talked to her parents about this and she says, oh, no, no, I can't talk to my mother and daddy. My daddy would kill me if he found out about this. He knows that whatever he does to her, she can't report it. And the analogy that I often draw on this, Kristen, and I'm sure you you remember us talking about this when you were on Life Talk, um, it's like a man, a married man who goes to a prostitute. If she robs him, he's not telling anybody. He can't mm -hmm. afford for anybody to know where he is and what he's doing. And these women in these abortion clinics are in that same exact position. So you've got a man with very sketchy morals, with total control over a young, and remember all these women are of childbearing age, so they're relatively young, um, over a young female who can't tell anybody where she is or what she's doing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what the possibilities are there. And we have documented this. This is not a theory. We've documented it. Wow. Have you ever seen, so when you guys uh, put together line five, documenting these sexual assaults that were going on, the women who are getting maimed, you know, hemorrhaging, um, I guess, have you seen any uh, positive outcomes where pro-life activists have been able to take your all's research at Life Dynamics and use it to put public pressure on officials who I don't know should be at least inspecting abortion facilities to, you know, just like how they inspect veterinary clinics and hair care salons. Have you seen uh, those outcomes from this investigative work you've done? Well, we've seen outcomes from it, but not in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have found is that um, most bureaucrats or elected officials um, don't want to touch the abortion industry. It is the third rail of American politics or American culture, and they don't want to get near it. So you can go to them, and, and I have done this, you can go to them with absolute irrefutable proof that's undeniable in a secular environment. In other words, it's not something the pro-life movement came up with, um, and show them this, and they won't move on it. They won't do anything about it. Um, you have abortion clinics operating right now, as you know, Kristen, in this country, who are operating under circumstances that you would not allow a vet clinic to remain open, but yet we will send women into these into these places. Now I said we have seen some results of the of the stuff that we've done, uh, but not in that way. The way we have seen results is from uh, CPC counselors and from sidewalk counselors in front of abortion clinics, who will take our information. I have got pictures of people standing in front of abortion clinics holding a line five and saying, telling this girl, wait a minute, before you go in there, you need to know this. If this mm -hmm. happens, you know, you need to know, know about this. Um, so we have seen a lot of that and mm -hmm. we have had um, reconnaissance women call back into our office who said that they were going to have an abortion. They were shown this information on the sidewalk as they were going in and change their mind and now have a child. And mm -hmm. you know the child's the center of their life. I got a call just yesterday from a crisis pregnancy um, uh, counselor in Jasper, Texas, who told me that I had helped her about 
uh, a year ago with the patient that was uh, that they were talking to with the girl that they were talking to who was adamant about having an abortion. Her mother was adamant about it. Her aunt was adamant about it. They used some information that we had given them and uh, turned it around and the baby was born yesterday or day before yesterday. And so you, we get those kind of calls and, and I'm sure you do too. Um, and those always kind of spur you on. And sometimes you wonder, are we making a difference here? If we save one baby, we're making a difference. Absolutely. You absolutely made a difference in my life and, and in the life of so many other pro-life activists who awakened us to the gory reality. It's, it's not what the abortion industry says, uh, what happens behind those closed doors. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Douglas Carpent? There hasn't really been a lot of press about what he had done. I know when uh, the Kermit Gosnell case uh, was in Philadelphia, I know pro-lifers there in Texas, and you're in Texas, uh, we're, we're talking about Carpin and his abortion business there in Houston. Um, can you can you tell people who he was uh, and what he was doing there at, in his abortion practice? Yeah, well, I'm sure as you've you've seen the video probably of our interview with three of his his employees, and um, this was when the the whole thing of of um, Gosnell doing abortions on uh, babies that were born, the ba babies born alive, and then they kill them outside the womb. Um, and these three women came forward and we did an interview with them. And you can go on YouTube. If you just go type in babies born alive daily, uh, you'll come up with our, our any interview that we did with them. And these women were saying this was a common occurrence, but almost a daily occurrence where they would have babies born alive and that he would kill them outside the womb. And he, um, <clears throat> I won't go into the more graphic things that he did, but some of the things that he did, he would twist their heads off um, or he would push his thumb into the soft spot of the baby's head. And these are two of the more, the ones that I can talk about versus some of the others that we, that are just too graphic for people to, to stomach. But um, he was killing these babies outside the womb and, and they were calling them big baby abortions. They're talking about babies that weigh six or seven pounds and um, that it takes an hour to kill one of these babies in the womb because they're so big and, it, and trying to get all the pieces out and so forth. Um, and one of the things that we found out during that interview, and by the way, almost a million people have watched that interview on YouTube. Um, and the interesting thing is YouTube has a counter on there that tells how many people watch. And it got up close to a million. It was like 997. And we were watching it every day. And it was going up, you know, a thousand a day or 800 a day or something like that. And we were just waiting for it to go over a million. Then we go on there one day and all of a sudden it's down to 976. And now it's back up to about 982. And they're, for, for whatever reason, they're clearly manipulating their al algorithm so that it doesn't go over a million. For some reason, they don't want that video going over a million, and I don't know why, but anyway, that's what's happening. Um, but Is he still committing abortions? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? What happened to Douglas Carpin? Does he still commit abortions? Right now, we understand he's out, but not because of anything that, that was revealed here. Um, mm -hmm. But one, one of the things that we did stumble across, and I, I was surprised I hadn't thought about this before, but these women were telling us how, you, you know how occasionally um, we will hear of a situation where um, a baby is found in the bathroom of a McDonald's or in the bathroom of an airport or something like that, and a mother can't be found nowhere around, <coughs> excuse me. They started telling us about instances they saw like that among patients that they had put laminaria in and were supposed to come back the next day for the abortion that never came back. Oh my gosh. And they said you could go on the news at night and see, and this is in Houston, they said the Houston police reported that, you know, a, a late term baby was found in the bathroom of a McDonald's and they can't find the mother. They don't know where she is or anything. And they were joking. They said, we always knew who it was. It was somebody that we we look at our records and we find somebody we we put laminaria in to expand her uterus so she could come back the next day, and all of a sudden she's not coming back, but there's a baby who appears in the bathroom of a McDonald's. She said we knew who that was, but we're not going to say anything. They're not they're not talking about that. 
But we see this occasionally, and I've often thought if we had the resources to do an investigation to where we could go, we could probably find those people sometimes, go mm-hmm. find them and ask them, did you go to a late-term abortion clinic and have laminaria inserted before this happened? And I think we'd find a very high percentage of them did because there's really no reason, if you think about it for a minute, for a woman to, to if she's pregnant and she inadvertently gives birth in a McDonald's parking lot, that she's not going to say something um, or go to the hospital. Um, There's really no reason for that other than the fact that she's trying to conceal it, which points to abortion. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. And it's unbelievable that when that, remember when that video came out with the three workers uh, who worked there with Douglas Carpin, kind of these whistleblowers, um, it, it wasn't on the national news. It didn't get covered. It was... You know, Kermit Gosnell's trial got covered because he was, you know, um, before a grand jury. And the only reason that got coverage uh, was because pro-lifers started to make a big stink. And I think some reporters, there was um, Kirsten Powers, a Democratic kind of operative, kind of stumbled upon it and wrote about it. And remember the USA Today and kind of said, this is this is crazy that no one is reporting this this murder case. Um, and she you know, said, I'm pro-choice, but we should be talking about this, that even as a pro-choice woman, this offends my sensibilities that there are these predators out there, you know, i.e. abortionists, doing this to women. Um, but I remember the, 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 the Douglas Carpin case uh, and the undercover work you guys did and the whistleblowers that you had come out never really got covered. What do you think we should do in the pro-life movement, pro-life activists should do? for how do we get this message out, especially in an age where, you know, we can't rely on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube to keep our channels up, to not shadow ban us, to allow us to even spread the message. I know we're like constantly saying, sign up for our email list, sign up for our texting list at Students Life because at any moment they can shut us down and we won't be able to communicate with you on social media. So you can't, what, what do you think we should be considering and looking for how do we promote and get the message out? Because as you said, these stories are getting worse. Yeah, they are getting worse because the abortion industry knows that they're pretty much insulated from any legal problems or, or um, uh, PR problems by the, by the media. The media totally mm-hmm. refuses to cover this stuff. You're not going to tell me that if that were any other environment except abortion, they wouldn't be covering it. You're not going to, you'll never convince me of that. You're, you're, you're a liar if you try to make that argument. Um, So, yeah, that's a challenge that we have to face, and it's a challenge we're going to have to face in the future because we've always complained about the the bias in the media. Well, the bias in social media is just as bad. So we have to learn how to work around that. But I want to make a point, uh, going back to something you and I talked about a moment ago, about returning to our roots and and staying on the pure pro-life message. One of the things, and I warned about this even when we did the video with the, the, with the three uh, workers in Houston from Douglas Carpin's office, mm-hmm. um, I started hearing even pro-lifers coming out and saying, oh, my God, they're killing living babies. <laughs> a five-week-old baby is a living baby. We're, making, we're falling into a trap right there. Mm-hmm. Because that allows the radical pro aborts like Kirsten Powers that you talked about. Don't let, don't be deceived by this woman. She's not upset by this. She just recognizes mm-hmm. the, the PR problem, and so she's trying to mm-hmm. get ahead of the PR problem. It's damage control. But what we do is we play into their agenda. When we come out here and say, "Look here, Carpin's having, uh, causing these babies to be born." alive and intact, and then he's killing. He's killing living babies. Well, he'd have killed them inside the womb. They're still the same living baby. But we're falling into the trap of of buying into the pro-aborts argument that there's a distinction between, say, a six-week unborn baby and a 26-week unborn baby when there isn't a difference. There is no moral distinction between those two babies. So we've got to be very careful about the rhetoric we're, we're using here. And The argument that I was making is that not that Carpin was killing living babies because he was already doing that, even if he does a first trimester abortion, but that this confirms that he's killing living babies. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about here is location. 
We're not talking about the morality or the the science behind this. We're just talking about location. If the baby's here, you can kill them. If the baby's over here, you can't. Well, that's mm -hmm. not the pro-life position. Our position should be that if he's killing, if he's only doing first trimester abortions, he's killing living babies. And mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that these pro-lifers are consciously thinking about this, but subconsciously that's what they're doing is they're confirming the pro-abortion position that there's a distinction between a six week baby and a 26. There's not. Yeah, we're giving preference to older children versus younger children because we, they look more like the children we took home from the hospital. Um, it's, they it's, look more like us. Yep, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so let's shift gears and talk about Ma'afa 21. Ma'afa, we try to get all students for life groups to show this video on campus, certainly use it in their group meetings to educate uh, pro-lifers about the origins of the abortion industry. Um, it's a, it's amazing. I mean, the amount of information that you get in this one documentary, I mean, I've had to watch it several, several times. And every time I watch it, I still find something new that I needed to know five years ago um, about the abortion industry. What turned you on? Like, how did you discover this? Okay. You know, Charles Darwin's cousin, just, you know, where did all this come from? Well, I had known for years, as most people in the pro-life movement had had known, that the origins of the abortion uh, holocaust in America was the mm -hmm. eugenics movement. Yeah. And, but it's one thing to say that; it's another thing to prove it. So what we decided was we would commit the resources that we had at the time to this documentary, and so we started researching it. We had uh, we did over three years research on this documentary because we wanted to make sure that we weren't saying anything that the pro aborts could sink their teeth into and say, Oh, that's a lie or that's not true. Or that never happened. So we made absolutely certain that we did that. And what we, what we did was we started with current times and started going backwards and look to see what led to this, what led to this. In other words, when, when we did X, what caused X to happen? And we, we kept on going backwards. And <clears throat> very quickly, we just, one of the most surprising things we discovered was that the original pro-life groups in this country were not National Right to Life or American Life League or certainly not Life Dynamics or, or Students for Life. It was the radical, what were considered the radical 60 civil rights groups, the Black Panthers, uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, the uh, people like Stokely Carmichael, mm -hmm. they had recognized early on that abortion was being pushed as an instrument of black genocide. They knew that already, as did people like Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson used to be hardcore pro-life. He came out here and called for a total constitutional ban on abortion, humanity, the personhood for the unborn child, he demanded that that happen, and he, he made the statement. He said, it's very interesting that the very moment when blacks started demanding their civil rights, all of a sudden, white liberals are calling for the legalization of abortion. He was the one who first picked up on that. Of course, the problem was he later on decided he wanted to be president, and he was going to run as a Democrat, and the Democrat Party was already owned by the abortion lobby. So he changed. So one year, literally, he was saying the greatest civil rights cause of our day is um, the right to life of the unborn. A year later, he was saying the greatest civil rights of our day, cause of our day is the right to abortion. That's how he changed. And it, it happened overnight. And others did the same thing. But some of them stuck to it. Um, but what we found was that these were the original anti-abortion groups in America. Hmm. And it went back into the late 50s. Because what had happened was the eugenics movement in America started out, and when, when we finally quit, we were all the way back to the, to the days before the slavery was outlawed. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was that um, when, when it became obvious in America that slavery was, was doomed at some point, mm -hmm. um, I mean, 
our two closest neighbors, Canada and Mexico, had already outlawed, outlawed slavery. Our big trading partners, England and France and, and other European countries, had already outlawed it. So we were the last holdout, and it was obvious that it was, it was going to die out. When that happened, you had these rich industrialists who had made billions of dollars on the backs of slaves now worried that they were going to lose all that money when these four million slaves were freed and, and put into the into the economy without the ability to support themselves. So mm -hmm. they started looking for ways to get rid of the slaves that they had made billions of dollars on. They looked at colonization, which was to send the slaves back to Africa. That wasn't going to work. You couldn't put four million slaves on ships. Most of them were born in America anyway. You couldn't You couldn't send them back to a country they'd never been to. Um, then they, about that same time, uh, Charles Darwin had written the uh, Origins of Man and uh, started talking about his racial agenda. Uh, his cousin was a man named Francis Galton. That's his, that's Tar Charles Darwin's first cousin. He came up with the term eugenics. The term eugenics did not exist before Francis Galton invented it. And it was a way to get rid of blacks, assuming that colonization wouldn't work. And they started trying various ways, forced sterilization, uh, forced birth control, for, forced um, uh, sterilization became the eventual thing that they went to back in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And you had eugenics boards, practicing eugenics boards in 31 states at that time. Um, and a lot of them were affiliated with Planned Parenthood operating out of the same offices. Um, when the Supreme Court and federal courts became started saying, no, you can't have sterilization, forced sterilization. They were requiring sterilization for people on welfare. They were requiring ster sterilization for people who were convicted of crimes. They were requiring forced sterilization for all kinds of people. And by the way, they were almost always black. Um, the court started ruling that this was unconstitutional. And when they lost forced sterilization, the American eugenics movement, of which Margaret Sanger was a member, she was a member of the American Eugenics Association Society, um, that's when they started calling for the legalization of abortion. And that's when these civil rights groups began to be suspicious of some of the people they were aligned with and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. A year ago, you had no interest in abortion, and we were saying that abortion was murder, and we can't do this. Now sterilization's going away, and all of a sudden you're calling for abortion. And we've done research into this, and they have specifically targeted, and we proved it. You can go online and read our documents on this. We have proven that they have targeted the black and now Hispanic communities uh, to have a disproportionate share of of um, the abortions in this country. And yeah, there's a just they just did a mecas brief on this okay. like there was an economist a group of uh, over 100 economists i don't know if you saw this i saw it was reading it this morning on the airplane over 100 economists wrote a brief a mecas brief for the Dobbs v uh jackson case and um and it was interesting because they actually said that abortion has improved overall improved the arc of black women's lives like it is literally an a eugenics brief in support of eugenics, but nicer. It's it's obscene, and yeah, they're they're saying it. It's it hasn't gone away. Well, President Johnson, when they were looking at uh, when the civil rights issue was big back in the mid '60s, one of the statements that he made, and we documented it and put it into into uh, MAFA 21, was that if the government would spend uh, five dollars on contraception in minority communities, that's better than spending $100 on economic development in those same communities. So which way do you think they went? And you started having uh, one particular guy named Greenlee, who was a Planned Parenthood doctor, he was black, and he picked up on this and he said, why is it that in, in our city, the black community has three Planned Parenthood facilities dispensing birth control, but the white community that, is, that butts right up against it, which is equally poor demographically, has none. Why are they focusing in on our communities? And he dropped out of the Planned Parenthood and, and started working against them. 
And wow. these are the sort of things that we document in, in my Alpha 21. But there is no doubt, there is no argument that abortion was legalized as an instrument of black genocide. I'm going to tell you right now, had slavery never existed, had slavery never come to America, abortion wouldn't be legal today. But slavery, the end of slavery set in motion all the dynamics that we proved in MAFA 21 led to the legalization of abortion. And we have to this day, we thought we would be lucky to put out 10,000 copies of MAFA. So far, we've put out 275,000 copies of it. Plus, it's been shown in, in churches and convention centers. It's been shown twice in, in the Capitol Visitor Center in Washington, D.C. Right. Millions of people have watched it. Over a million have watched it on YouTube for free. Uh, they can go to maafa21.com, oh, our website, question. and they can watch it for free. Maafa21.com, M-A-A-F-A-21.com. Uh, right. And right. yet, despite the widespread... Uh, distribution of this thing, we have never been challenged. And, and I have an open challenge to anyone on the pro-abortion side. You go through my offer 21 and you find out where we were deceptive or where we said something that wasn't true or that we couldn't document. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take it out of the office from that point over. And I'll apologize for having put out this, uh, uh, this dishonest information. We've never had one person take us up on that. It's good. That means you I mean, you've done your work. This is the man, guys. If you want to know an investigative journalist in the pro-life movement, you need to know Mark Crutcher and his team at Life Dynamics. Mark, I've got to wrap it up. I've got um, oodles of information. I've been taking notes, actually, of some things you said. I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, because I've got to go brush up on my Maafa 21 documentary, watch it, uh, and dust off my copy of Line 5. And I hope you all will, will tune in to Mark's podcast and all the amazing work that they're doing at Life Dynamics. I can't wait to hear what this new project is, even though he won't tell us. Um, so I've, I'm going to have to stay uh, in the loop. But thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for helping us um, kind of dissect a little bit more of these abortion crimes that are happening every day in abortion facilities across the country. And thank you all for tuning in uh, and listening to this new episode of Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. Make sure you share this season.